Good day, my dear viewers. Uh, this is Dmitry Balkovsky of Russia Move, and let me introduce to you Father Joseph Gleason, uh, an American uh, Orthodox priest uh, who moved to Russia several years ago uh, with his large family, and he is very active uh, in the sphere of uh, bringing in conservative Westerners, bringing them into Russia and settling them here. Uh, he is a, um, getting a kind of a celebrity st status in Russia, small but uh, growing. So uh, it will be a very interesting talk, I believe. Please comment, like, and subscribe. There is going to be a link in the description to Father Gleason's contacts so you can write to him, follow him uh, on Substack and uh, his other media. So yes, let us begin. Uh, good day to you, Father Gleason. Good day. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you for agreeing to talk to us. Yes, it is very interesting, uh, very exotic, I would say, for both for Russia and for, for the United States, English-speaking Orthodox priests. I know that uh, there are Orthodox in the States, but uh, still, you know, it's very, very, um, very interesting, very intriguing. So uh, could you tell us about yourself a little bit, about your family and your way to Russia? How, uh, how did you find yourself in this uh, cold corner of the world? Well, the weather may be cold, but the hearts are warm and the, the, you know, the Orthodox churches are absolutely beautiful. In America, I just saw that things were going downhill morally in a lot of ways. And one of the things that bothered me most was how they were more and more accepting of LGBT and transgender and all these these terrible things. And I know that you know, when you look in scripture and when you look in history, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. But not only Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, there are many other civilizations and towns and places in history that have been destroyed because they accepted these types of uh, sexual perversions. And so when I saw that America was accepting these things, even at the highest levels of the federal government, I realized that that's not a place I wanted to stay with my children. That's not where I wanted to continue raising my family. And in 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, declared that everywhere in the entire United States, all 50 states, they had to accept this lie of you know gay marriage, they called it. And that was the moment at which I realized that we just needed to leave. And the reason I chose Russia, you know, I could have moved to many other places and looked at other countries, but the reason that my wife and my eight children and I came here is because Russia does not have homosexual marriage. It does not have civil unions. Uh, in Russia, homeschooling is legal, which is very important to us. And also, I really appreciate the Russian military. In many other countries in the world, if America decides that it wants to intervene and cause problems, they can show up with their military and they can do that. But I felt like the Russian military is strong enough that even if America tried to interfere here, they would not be able to. So for those three reasons, I thought Russia would be a really good place to come. And of course, I absolutely love the thousand year history of orthodox christianity here mm -hmm. which obviously is something that america does not have so there are a lot of reasons that my wife and children and i found russia to be very attractive and so we moved here six years ago so it's been six years yeah well it's quite a while so i suppose you would have uh, a formed view of things here because Russia is a conservative society, but it is secular conservative. It's not as deeply religious as maybe even some parts of the United States, even at the moment. So, uh, uh, could, could you could you tell us uh, uh, what are the good and bad things? And I always, actually, I always emphasize bad when I talk to um, English speakers who live here, because, like for, for for the conservatives, Russia is sort of a beacon. Uh, I guess so. It's 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 clear in many ways. But what would you what would you change for the best? I mean, I'm I'm not uh, 
trying to get you to talk bad about Russia because you know I'm 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 in the same uh, kind of uh, way of thinking and I'm trying to bring mm-hmm. people here, but you know just for for balance, you know. Yeah, we just want we want to be honest with people. We know that neither Russia nor America are you know a paradise. There's good and there's bad in both places, and Russia is no exception to that. You know, I've already said several of the good things that I love about Russia. We obviously love it because we moved here. But there are some negatives also. Um, Russia has one of the highest rates of abortion in the world. And, and that's a big problem. I'm, I'm grateful that the numbers have been dropping over the years. You know, over the past 30 years, the numbers have been coming down, but they're still very, very high, very high. And for Russia to be a fully civilized country, uh, we need to put an end to abortion. You know, you cannot be a civilized country if you are murdering your own children. So that's one thing that I would like to see. I'm I'm grateful that some of the laws have changed in that regard. They certainly are doing better. They're requiring women to see an ultrasound of their baby before they have an abortion. Um, they're making it more difficult. They're passing different laws to try to you know, bring the numbers down, but I will not be satisfied in that particular area until Russia returns to its former ways, you know, back when it was an empire and makes abortion completely illegal. And that's what I eventually hope will happen here. Right, right, right. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I, I don't know whether you know, but uh, abortion was made legal in the Soviet Union in, uh, in in the Bolshevik Russia. It was not even the Soviet Union in 1920, and in 1990, when it was almost over, there was this uh, like um, call it a like a sacrifice to to to, to the dark gods or something that the the Soviets uh, in 1990 committed over 4 million abortions in one year, you know? There was, uh, uh, the Soviet Union was born in blood and it died in blood, you know, it was it was, it was was horrible. Now it's way better, now it's way better, for, for sure. It's probably probably less than 10% of that horrible number well, well, that, that was in 1990. Yeah, but it was a very, it is a very valid remark. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for yeah. your balance, you know, because some people think that Russia is some kind of a Eastern Orthodox Switzerland with all the goods of the West. Uh, Orthodoxy, but nothing bad. But it's 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 not true. Uh, Father, I know that you you have a um, a very interesting project that you're promoting uh, in uh, in the field of theology and uh, uh, but but patristics. I, I I would suppose, right? Could you could you please tell us about it more? Yeah, my pleasure. My friend uh, Father Konstantin Bufeyev has been a priest for many years in Moscow. And before he became a priest, he was a scientist. He got an advanced degree in geology and was very skilled in that field. And then he became a priest. And so he has the eyes of a scientist and also the eyes of a, of a priest, of a churchman. And over a period of more than 20 years, he did a great amount of study and research into both what the Bible says and what the church fathers have said, and also about what the scientific evidence is regarding creation and evolution. As everyone knows, it can be a very controversial subject, especially among Christians. Um, But he has just put together a fantastic, fantastic uh, three-book set, three volumes, uh, it's more. It's almost a thousand four hundred pages total, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's just it's absolutely beautiful. You know, he's made a masterpiece. It's uh, beautifully bound. It's a three volume set, and the first book in the series he focuses on church history, the writings of the saints, and also the holy scriptures. Mm-hmm. And he points out how consistently, for two thousand years, the church has very clearly taught that God created the universe in six days, rested on the seventh, uh, that God created the first man out of the dust of the ground. He created the first woman, you know, with a rib from Adam's side. And that Adam and Eve are real historical people and that they are 
Just as it says in the New Testament in the Gospel of Luke, Adam is a direct ancestor of Jesus Christ. So you think about all these things. Um, if Adam is not a real person, if Adam is only a imaginary person, a fictional person, then Jesus Christ also must be a fictional person. But if Jesus is real, then when the Gospel of Luke talks about Jesus' ancestor, Adam, Adam also must be real, an actual historic person. Uh, also, in the New Testament, it clearly states that there was no death prior to Adam and Eve's sin. But if there, were not, if there was no death, then it's impossible that you had billions of years of death and fighting and blood uh, just to create man. You know, it's not even possible. You can't have evolution if you cannot have death before the fall. So these are, you know, these are not only scientific questions, they are real theological, uh, historical issues that the church has dealt with for a long time, both before Darwin and after Darwin. Um, after Darwin, you have saints such as St. Luke of Crimea, uh, you have uh, St. Theophon the Recluse, and they clearly taught that, um, you know, this idea of evolution of, you know, one animal changing into a completely different type of animal and eventually changing into a human, that this is impossible. It's scientifically impossible. Even though Darwin popularized his ideas in the late 1800s, uh, the idea of evolution has been around since the ancient Greeks. It's been around for more than 2,000 years. Uh, even prior to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, there were ancient Greek philosophers that theorized about uh, various ideas and types of evolution. And even Aristotle wrote about this. So it's nothing new to the church. Right. And for 2,000 years, the church and the church fathers have rejected this idea. Now, that's just the first book. The second book in the series, uh, Father Constantine focuses on the science. So uh, he talks uh, about the scientists themselves, including Darwin. And then he also so it talks about archaeology, microbiology, uh, the fossil record, geology, uh, dating systems. And he goes into a lot of detail explaining how that if you actually look at the observable evidence, um, there's no requirement for us to believe in billions of years or to believe in you know, evolution of uh, molecules becoming man. And it's interesting when he talks specifically about Darwin. Uh, you know, there are some people who try to claim that Darwin was some sort of Christian or that Darwin was kind of a believer and that he didn't see anything discordant between evolution and and uh, belief in God. Right. But in this book, he actually quotes some of Darwin's own words, not from Darwin's books, but from Darwin's letters, his correspondence with friends. And... In some of his letters, Darwin openly admitted that he did not believe in the existence of God. He was an atheist. Mm -hmm. And also in his correspondence, Darwin admitted that he found pleasure in turning people away from God. He said that if he just went out on the street and he said, there is no God, there is no God, then nobody would listen to him. But by teaching this godless idea of the evolution of man from animals. Um, he said that he accomplished it by kind of going undercover. You know, he would convince people of this idea, and then later, as the idea worked itself out in their thoughts, later people would abandon God and would stop believing. Mm -hmm. And and this is from Darwin's own correspondence with friends. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know so, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a very, very interesting. The second book is very interesting. Uh, he also has a really interesting uh, film review in there of Sonyechny Udar, uh, Sunstroke, the film that came out in 2014, I think it was. Uh, Michal Kols, right? And, yes, yes. And he pointed out how the movie really, you know, because the, the question throughout the movie is, how did this all happen? How did we get here? Right, right. How right. did everything fall apart? And the answer given in the movie, if you're paying attention closely, is Darwin and Darwinism. Because the little boy, 
There is this scheme on 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 the on the, on the hill, the sunny day, right? Yeah, yeah. And the boy, you know, he he was just learning about Darwinism, and his science yeah. teacher told him there is no God, that everything comes from monkeys, and he said. Even the czar, the czar yes, comes from yes, monkeys. Yes, yes, yes. Even my mom and my dad, even my priest, even my bishop comes from monkeys. And the kid's just trying to work these things out. And he was a good kid. He was a good kid. He uh, was an altar boy. He went to church. He made the sign of the cross. He was honest. He was kind. But he's well. If mom and dad are just for monkeys, why should I listen to him? If my bishop is from a monkey, why should I listen to him? You know, it's blasphemy. But, you know, what would he then think of Jesus Christ? He must be from a monkey too, you know? And if that's the way he started thinking, then of course, by the time it's 1920, he's not going to church on Sundays at all. He doesn't believe anymore. He thinks it's all lies. And if the czar was nothing more than a descendant of a monkey, then... It doesn't matter that he was killed. And if his mom and dad are just for monkeys, then why listen to him? And so by the end of the movie, he had, even though he had been a nice boy when he was young, he grows into an adult who is a mass murderer. And so he takes that, that pocket watch and he wraps it in Proisogenia Vidov, the origin of species. And and delivers it to the lieutenant. And the lieutenant opens it and he sees it and he realizes that's the same kid, the same kid that had made the sign of the cross and had been so kind and loving to him, uh, only a few years later is now the one who's killing him. Right. So how did this all happen? How did we get here? Well, uh, the lies of Darwinism being taught in the schools, that's how we got here. Right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that 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 was a very powerful moment for sure. Yeah, I remember that. I remember yeah. that. I, I, I always quote quoted to some uh, quoted it to some people in the past. Yes, yes, yes. When he's saying that the teacher was kind, uh caring, uh like an angel. Yeah, yeah, quite and then in the third book, uh, Father Constantine, he responds to critics. So of course, there are some people that they think it's possible to be an Orthodox Christian and faithful to the Bible and faithful to the Church Fathers, but they still want to believe in billions of years, and they still want to believe in evolution. And so they try to mix them together, but it doesn't work. And so in the third book, Father Constantine responds to these different critics mm -hmm. and points out the problems in their thinking. So what I am doing is <clears throat> I have started a fundraiser. And we are collecting funds to pay for a translation of this entire three-volume set from Russian into English, because I think America needs these three books. I think America, Canada, Australia, and England need to have these books available in English so that they can see a really powerful, uh, good example of what you know theology and science uh coming together to really look like so that they can understand uh why if you're going to be a faithful christian you really can't hold to darwinian evolution uh and because these books do such a good job of explaining it um i'm really excited about this uh work that we're doing to translate it into english okay okay so uh we will have uh the links do you find a uh, fundraiser in the description as well yeah so yeah. everyone who, who, who is willing to help you know will be very well welcome and we yeah, will be very thankful if you can uh help uh promote this project because uh, yeah we, we, we need uh we need a response to to the modernity let me put it this way yeah so i, th I think it's it's important and uh we uh, we thank everyone in advance uh those who could be uh yeah, who'd be willing to help. Going back to uh, Russia and your experience as an American in Russia, uh, how is, um, you live in uh, Rostov Veliki, Rostov the Great. It's in, uh, to the northeast of Moscow. It's a very, it is a very historical area, very, very, very old. It is Russia, 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 you know, Ra Russia Square and Russia Cube, basically. Uh, how do locals treat your family, uh, yourself, your children? 
what, what's what's your impression? Because I know that there is fear that because of the um, conflict in Ukraine, Russians, ordinary Russians, will be throwing stones at Americans and you know mistreating you and all that. So, how how is that going for you? It's going well. People, for the most part, have been friendly since we have gotten here. Uh, you know, people here that meet us, they know um, really the American people are not the enemy. The enemy is the American government. And the American government is not only persecuting Russia, but the American government persecutes the American people also. So even if you're a Christian living in America, um, you know, you're having difficulties there as well. So I actually, you know, I think a lot of Russians understand that. They understand that even though the government in America is doing these things, that doesn't mean that every individual American is guilty. And the Russians that I meet, they understand that I'm not in agreement with these American policies. Right. And so I think that helps a lot because you know, Russians know that I am standing with Russia and I support what Russia is doing in Ukraine. You know, Russia didn't start anything. The, this war did not start in 2022. The war started in 2014. And you had Maidan and you had eight years of nonstop shooting and bombings and uh, attack on the Russian people in the Donetsk area, in Luhansk. The Russian government tried every diplomatic option that they had available. They went to the world. They said, look, we need peace. We need to stop this, uh, this killing, this bloodshed. And the rest of the world just was silent. They refused to respond. You know, even when Ukraine lied and agreed to the Minsk Accords, uh, it was a lie. They since have admitted that the only reason they verbally agreed to them was so they could buy more time to strengthen their military. So they have never had a goal to have peace. Their goal from the beginning has been war with Russia. So I don't really see this as something that Russia, you know, had any option to avoid. Russia tried every diplomatic way of avoiding it. And the only way to avoid it completely would be just to say, we don't care about those millions of Russians living in eastern Ukraine. You, know, you can just keep killing them and we're going to do nothing about it. And that would be immoral. That would be wrong. You know, Russians that I talk to, they know that I'm in agreement with what Russia is doing. So they don't seem to have any problem with me personally. All right. Yeah, that, 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 that has been my experience as well. No, no one in Moscow attacks you when you speak English uh, on, on the street, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's smiling pretty much uh, with curiosity. There is no hostility. Yeah. Now, let me ask you about the West, uh, this moral turmoil, uh, turmoil on many levels, economic, financial. Uh, well, what do you think are the roots? Should we talk about... Uh, Protestant roots, maybe, of this, of, of what's happening in, in some way, or is it a valid proposition? What, what's your view of that? I mean, I think there's a lot of things contributing. I think it's very complex, you know, whenever you talk about economics. There are many things that, uh, you know, that have been done wrong in America, but it's, it's a much bigger problem than just the past five years or 10 years or even, you know, right. 50 years. You know, historically, in, in the Holy Scriptures, and also in the teachings of the church fathers, you know, God made it very clear and the church has made it very clear. You really are not supposed to even charge interest for loan. And yet, you know, banks have been doing that for a very long time. You know, so it's been several centuries ago that it started becoming more and more uh, legal, more and more publicly acceptable. And so you have usury or, you know, charging interest on a, on a wide scale that can, has continued to cause many problems. Um, you have inflation that's caused by devaluing the currency whenever uh, the whenever the government prints more and more currency so that they can pay their bills. Uh, well, it makes you know each dollar or ruble that they have worth less. So people's money becomes worth it less and less and less. That's a huge problem. Uh, you know, also there there's just been a number of laws that have been implemented that are not. That are not helpful to the little guy, you know, people like you and me. The government will pass laws that protect large multi-billion dollar corporations and give them certain exemptions and tax breaks. Um, they'll also pass regulations that it may cost you millions of dollars to do certain security checks or uh, health inspections and things that a multi-billion dollar corporation can easily afford, but that a small company cannot. 
And so these things are, you know, they're not stupid. These things are strategic and they keep doing more and more and more of these things so that the tiny businesses and the family businesses go out of business. And you're left with these big giant corporations that are not there to help people. They're there just to make uh, the greatest profit that they can make. And so, you know, I don't think there's any one single root cause. I don't think it's just, you know, Protestantism or Catholicism or the banks. I think, um, you know, ultimately, it's the answer to every problem. Uh, Man has forgotten God. Uh, It's not that the people in power are trying their best to follow Christ and to do what is right and good, and they're just making mistakes. It's they're not even trying. Uh, The people in power and the people that have big money, uh, they're living for themselves. They're living selfishly. And and sadly, even a lot of the little guys, people like you and me, uh, a lot of people have completely lost sight of the spiritual and they're focusing more on the material. And whenever that happens, you have a, a degrading of the morals of society. But when you have a degrading of the morals of society, you end up in tyranny. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing uh, the morals of society have decreased to the point uh, and people's materialism has increased to the point that uh, we're in the process of seeing people becoming enslaved. From my point of view, you know, uh, uh, Westerners have fallen asleep right about 1945 and they've been slumbering deeper and deeper and deeper. And now there is a Rude awakening, you know, it's always, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar to what happened in the late Soviet Union, actually. Everyone was feeling very secure. I, I remember when I was growing up here, you know, I was, uh, there was complete sense of security. And then it all shattered within like several years. And I was young, so it was, it was all right for me. But for people who were like in their 40s, it was a tragedy. It was complete, complete, many people just died of, uh, they, they were like fish out of water, you know? So yeah, that, that's, that's tragic, tragic. What would you say to those who are looking to move to Russia? Should they proceed? What's your view? I think so. I think it's a very good thing to do. I think uh, morally it's, you know, especially compared to America and compared to Western Europe, I think Russia is a much better place to raise a family. You can be traditional... Christians and the government will leave you alone. You know, it's not a paradise. It's not a perfect place, but it's not like America or Canada where simply by being opposed to LGBT that you risk losing your job or getting kicked out of university. At least in Russia, you can hold traditional Christian values and live at peace, you know, with society. And that's important. I do think it's good for people to move here. One of the things I have found most challenging is uh, to learn the Russian language. Uh, I love the Russian language, and I actually do speak Russian, but even after being here six years, I make a lot of mistakes. You know, I make enough mistakes that I would be embarrassed to, you know, be recorded uh, <laughs> just right, trying right. to do it online. But it just, ta- it just takes a lot of work. So anybody that wants to move here, I would highly recommend, you know, start now, even before you move to Russia, do your best to you know, get a teacher, get a book, uh, start watching some Russian shows or listening to some Russian music, and just realize Russian is a beautiful language. It's a good language to learn, but it's going to take a while. You know, if you're an English speaker, it's very difficult to learn Russian. It's going to take a few years. So I would tell anybody wanting to move here, you know, that's going to be one of the difficult things. And so just get, you know, don't don't shy away from it, but get started right away. That way you can already have some Russian knowledge before you arrive here. Right, right, right. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Yes, it is a bit of an obstacle. And people who speak only one language, it, it is difficult. It's sa- same for Russians, actually, because Russians, the majority are monolingual, as the, the Americans, for example. So, yeah, it, 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 yes. is, it is a challenge. But it can can be can be done. can be done. Yeah, yeah, it can be done. Uh, okay, so, uh, and your... Uh, forecast for the next three to five years what should we expect and where will russia be do you think so uh in 2015 the united states supreme court uh said that the whole country must accept 
homosexual uh, so-called marriage. <clears throat> um, but that was just the Supreme Court. Uh, last year, towards the end of 2022, it got much worse. Now, in America, Congress, the Senate, and the President of the United States, they all signed and passed a law so that now the executive and legislative branch of the federal government has said, you must accept homosexual marriage. So now all three branches of the federal government in America are backing uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, basically. Also last year, late in 2022, uh, the Russian federal government did exactly the opposite. The Duma and the Federation Council unanimously passed a new law, and Putin signed it, which makes homosexual propaganda illegal not only for minors, but for everybody. So no homosexual propaganda for any ages at all, even for adults. And I think this is very, very powerful that you have all three branches of the American federal government standing with Sodom and Gomorrah and all three branches of the, you know, all the branches of the federal government in Russia standing against Sodom and Gomorrah and standing with Christ on that particular topic. And then you look at the prophecies of the saints. There are a number of Russian saints and different holy men. Well, even there was a St. Lawrence of Chernigov, uh, you know, fairly recently. You know, they've made some pretty specific predictions about the fall of the United States and the rise of Russia and the growth of the Russian church. And, you know, some, there are some of the Holy Fathers, you know, that lived 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And some of them have prophesied that, you know, even when the, the very end of the world comes, when you have, you know, this wicked world ruler, you know, over everything, that the one place where he will not come into power will be Russia. Now, again, that does not mean that Russia is perfect. It does not mean that this is paradise. But the saints do say that there will be divine liturgy served here until the very end of time, until the very mm -hmm. end of the world. So you're going to have people here in Russia who are Christian, who are attending divine liturgy, who are going to confession, who are taking the body and blood of Christ, who are repenting of their sins. Um, until the very end of the world. And I think that's really powerful. So when you look at what the saints have said in their prophecies, yeah, so when you see that all three branches of the federal government in America are siding with Sodom and Gomorrah, and when you see that the federal government in Russia is going the opposite direction and is siding with the saints and siding with the teachings of Scripture, it really makes the prophecies of the saints that much more believable that the stage is being set for America to have much greater problems and to fall from, you know, its power that it currently has, and for Russia to receive God's blessings on a, on a very great scale. And there are some of the more recent holy elders and saints that have even prophesied that people would come from all over the world and would immigrate to Russia, and that the broken down country churches would be rebuilt, that you'd have Orthodox Christian families living around those churches, and it's going to be something just amazing for the world to see. Now, I don't know that all of that's going to happen within the next five years, but I think we're seeing the beginnings of it already. All the time I'm getting contacts from new people, new families who are wanting to escape Canada, escape America, escape England and Australia, and move here. And they want to do it primarily not because of economic reasons or family reasons, but because of the faith. The more you see people moving here because they have a love for the Orthodox Christian faith and a love for Christ, what can that do but bring blessings to Russia? No, no, no exactly, exactly. That, that is something that I, uh, yeah, I used to read these things 25 years ago, actually, in the 90s. And yes, they they... They appear to me to be, uh, you know, so, so something for the future. And yes, yes, it, it, it looks like it is happening at the moment because the same here, I'm getting messages from people from all over the English speaking world. And yes, Russia, uh, pe people are still uh, wary, you know, they're not 
Uh, Russia still has a bad image in many people's heads, but uh, it's slowly changing. So yes, yes, there is, there is, a, there is a bright future in that. I believe so. Yes, I believe so. Thank you, Father Gleason, for your time. For uh, my, my pleasure, to talk to us and. Uh, Again, everything, uh, about the information about your project and the links to your uh, uh, media, uh, they are in the description below. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.